morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the Child and Family Learning Network webinar today. The Child and Family Learning Network is comprised of five communities of practice, which includes just-in-time parenting, family caregiving, financial security for all, e-extension alliance for better child care, and family food and fitness. The purpose of the Child and Family Learning Network is to create a multidisciplinary approach to family consumer sciences for the nation and for the Cooperative Extension Service. You can see on the screen the ways you can, can, can connect with us. We recently started a blog and we're always looking for guest bloggers. So if you're interested, please email me and I will put my email in the chat box shortly after this. We are also on Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And I encourage you to visit our social media sites and either friend, follow, share, pin, or view our resources. Please go to the Learn event and mark that you attended today's session. The event is being recorded today, and you can go back and listen to the webinar through the Learn link or on our website later on. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Hunter and Dr. Marty Gillen. Jennifer is an Extension Specialist for Family Financial Management at the University of Kentucky, and Marty is a Family and Consumer Economics for Older Adults Assistant Professor at the University of Florida. Jennifer and Marty are presenters today and will be discussing health and wealth across the lifespan. As a reminder, please mute your phones using the mute button or pressing star six. If you have questions or comments, please use the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen, and there will be time at the end of the webinar for questions. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to present to you Dr. Jennifer Hunter and Dr. Marty Gillen. Katie, thank you, and Marty and I both appreciate being asked by the Learning Network today to share the two curriculums dealing with youth as well as older adults. I'm going to start today by introducing the Building a Healthy, Wealthy Future curriculum. However, just as a little bit of background knowledge, both the youth curriculum as well as the older adult curriculum were developed as complements to the Small Steps to Health and Wealth program. As I'm certain that most of you all are familiar with Small Steps to Health and Wealth, it was developed by Barbara O'Neill and Karen Insel at Rutgers University and has been delivered nationwide. And it simultaneously encourages Americans to improve both their health and personal finances. As Barb and Karen developed the Small Steps to Health and Wealth program, they put together several similarities between health and finances. And so just a very few examples of that may be that Problems start small, so our financial problems tend to start with just maybe swiping the credit card once or twice to, to get by through the month. Or maybe a health problem starts with um, adding an afternoon snack or an afternoon Coke or soft drink. But those um, problems can add up to be more significant problems over time. And also, as time has progressed, that there's fewer stigma associated with having issues with maybe your health or weight or finances. Other similar similarities include that there's a lot of technical jargon, both in health and finances, that sometimes can be very con confusing to consumers. There can be some extreme solutions to both health problems and financial problems. And those have some, some major consequences and some serious drawbacks, as well as um, Improving your health and increasing your wealth are both strongly related. As part of the Small Steps to Health and Wealth program, they developed 25 behavior change strategies. And I just pulled out a very few today to, to kind of give you an overview. But examples may be of meeting yourself halfway or tracking your current habits, automating good habits. And these are things that as we develop the youth and the aging curriculum, that we use to make certain that we were complementing the original Small Steps to Health and Wealth program, but then also targeting our own specific audiences. The Building Healthy Wealthy Future was designed as the youth component to Small Steps to Health and Wealth. And our target age group has really been sixth to eighth graders. So as we developed the material, that was the age group that we were focusing on. However, in Kentucky, we have used it in, with fifth grade as well as ninth grade populations, and it seems to work really well within that range. I think if you go much younger than that, it's possible to adapt it some, but you have to maybe start changing around some of the verbiage or some of the activities. And it's the same way if you go much older than that. Some of it may start appearing somewhat juvenile to, to older students. 
The key focus areas of the curriculum are personal finance, health education, leadership development, and life skills. So we really wanted it to be much more than just health or just finance related, but we wanted to make certain that, that we were growing students in a variety of ways. There's two different components to the Building Healthy Wealthy Future program. There's a school-based student activity series, and I view this as at least traditionally what we might do in Kentucky as going in and doing an extension program in the school system, if that's during the traditional school day, if that's part of after school programming, or if that would be a program that is offered at the local extension office. But it is led by either a volunteer leader or by the extension agent, and there are um, a set of lesson plans that the leader would go through. There's also a parent-child activity series, and that's more of a set of extension publications, and it goes along with each lesson in the student-based school activity, and um, that could be something that the leader could use as a handout to send home with the child for further reinforcement at home, or it is something that, that could also be standalone that if a parent is calling into the extension office asking questions about maybe how they could communicate with their child more about finances or health, that those are tools that could be used. The curriculum objectives are to introduce positive financial and health behaviors to adolescents. And I think that that's key, that our true message is focusing on what are positive behaviors. And we want all messages that we present throughout the Building Healthy Wealthy Future curriculum is to be, to be positive messages. So we're not necessarily out there telling a, a child that they should go on a diet or anything like that. It's just putting forward good, solid information and helping the student become more aware of the type of information that is going on around them and how that might influence both their health and financial decisions, not only now but in the future. We also want to assist adolescents in understanding this relationship between personal behaviors and health and financial success. So we want to help them understand how a specific behavior, such as maybe getting a snack every day after school at the vending machine might over time add up into a poor um, health choice and also a poor financial choice. I think somehow we got off on slides there, but um, the curriculum consists of a leader's guide that is designed as a six-week series of learning lessons. And the instructor can choose activities that reflect learning objectives, time requirements, and available materials. We tried to make the curriculum as flexible as possible. I fully realized that the opportunity to have six reoccurring weeks with the same group of students, but that doesn't happen very often. So you do have the ability to go in and select. Katie, I'm not certain what's happening with the slides because I'm not hitting anything. Do you know? Yeah, I'm progressing for you. It's just oh. Because I, I could tell there was some issues, so. Okay, I think this is Marty. I can't even see the slides changing. Well, Miss Lisa, do you know um, what the? And I can't ask questions either. Uh, questions can be uh, directed into the chat box. I tried. It's not showing up. Hmm. Um, if you want to start a private chat with Miss Lisa, Marty, that may be helpful. Um, for the time being. Do we think that the other participants are seeing the slides? Yeah, I'm seeing the slides. Okay. So okay, so Katie, let me just try to advance them okay. myself and, and see how that works. Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry about the technical difficulties there, but um, back on track. So the curriculum consists of a leader's guide, and as I was saying, that we tried to design it to be very flexible to your situation. Um, one of the components of the, the program is, is that we want the students to actually take what they've learned in that classroom setting or in the extension meeting setting and being able to apply it at home. And so to do that, in addition to the learning lessons, we've also included a series called Take a Small Step, 
which incorporates a snack break, a financial break, and a physical activity break. And we really want those to be hands-on things that the students can see. This is what I learned today in this session. This is how I can truly use that in real life. And as we progress through, we will look at those a little bit closer. As I mentioned, there's six different learning lessons. And the program starts off with an introduction. And that really just gives the youth an overall idea of what we will be talking about, what um, type of financial behaviors we'll be looking at, what type of health behaviors that we will be looking at. The first lesson deals with establishing a baseline. And we know this in, in our lives that sometimes we eat and don't realize it. Sometimes we spend and do not realize it. And so we actually go through this lesson of having students establish their baseline and actually have them do a food recall and have them do a mini spending diary so that they can kind of start to see, well, how much do I really cost? How much are mom and dad spending on me in a, a short period of time? Well, what types of food am I really consuming? And again, we're not overly concerned about, we, we don't want them counting calories or anything like that. It's just putting it down on paper and they can see, oh, well, maybe I do have more soft drinks in a day than what I realized. Or I didn't, I didn't realize that I was eating chips every day. So that they can start to, to see what some of their dietary habits are. The second lesson deals with getting the right message. And as you all are well aware that uh, media is, is prevalent, uh, especially targeted at adolescents that they receive it from all different angles. It's not just TV. It's not just something that they might get from their magazine. They're getting ads on Facebook. They're getting ads on all different types of apps from their phone. They're getting messages from their peers. They also receive messages from their parents, their grandparents, their mentors. And we really want to focus, again, on helping them receive a positive message. So we want them to understand where they are receiving their messages. And I often cite this as an example that I have a son that just loves football. And when he was very small, kindergarten age, he came home and started asking for Under, Arm, Under Armour clothing. Well, it took me a while to realize that the connection was that he was watching. Uh, one of his favorite teams was the Oregon Ducks. And at that time, the Oregon Ducks wore Under Armour. And so he was pulling that message from watching football, which we would normally think of as um, not real media heavy that he was pulling the message from, but well, it was cool for him to wear Under Armour. So just helping them understand where they receive their messages from, and especially those messages that are focused on health behaviors or financial behaviors. The fourth lesson is getting the most out of life, which really focuses on goal setting. We know that it is important for youth to set goals, and we want to help them set goals that they can achieve and obtain. And we want to also help them identify, well, what happens if there's a setback? What do I do? How do I just not say, oh, I can never do that? And so that lesson kind of walks them through that process. The um, last lesson deals with be a rebel. And if we look at research, there's all types of statistics out there that are, are negative towards you. And we want to help them defy those statistics. So we want to make them aware of what some of those um, health statistics are and what some of those financial statistics are. And we want to help them develop strategies or ideas about how they might be able to avoid becoming a statistic. The Leader's Guide is in, broke up into different activities. Each lesson has three different activities. It has a um, health-focused activity, a financial-focused activity, and then also a physical activity break. So just to give you a small example of what this may look like, this is lesson one, establish your baseline. What is my starting point? So this deals with the health focus of doing the 24-hour food recall so they can start seeing what types of food they're eating, maybe what their, their plate, my plate, looks like. You can see on this that there, um, the time that each unit takes is listed, the materials needed for the instructor is listed, and then also we give talking points for the instructor. The second activity, which is the physical activity, is let's get moving. And so as we want them to become aware of what type of foods they're consuming, how they're spending, we also want them to become aware of how much physical activity they're also getting. The third activity focuses on the how much do I cost. 
And this is just an example. There's several worksheets embedded into the curriculum that the, the leader can copy and use with the students. As I mentioned early on, we have a series of snack breaks, financial breaks, and physical education breaks. And this is how they can take this home and actually implement it into their life. So an example of this may be, especially if you're doing this as an after school type activity, would be to include some type of snack. We have had great success in Kentucky with using this curriculum through our SNAP educators. And the, the snack component of that really helps work with them. And so an example here would just be an apple salad or a chicken salad, something that's quick and easy, provides all ingredients. If you have time, you can allow the students to make them the item itself. If you do not have time, obviously you can pre-prepare it and bring it with you. With each snack break, there is also a recipe card that goes along with it. And as part of the curriculum, we encourage obviously copying these, maybe putting a, a hole in it and putting like a key ring on it and providing those to the students again so that they can take it home and replicate it. This is an example of a finance break which focuses on couponing. And as couponing has become more and more popular and it's, as students watch it on TV and that type thing, it's become more and more of a cool thing to do. And so this is just something that they could take home with them, an example of how they might use couponing at home. And the physical activity break, again, if you're doing this as an after school activity, we know that they have sat for the majority of the day. And we know that we need to get them up and moving. And so these are just fun things that can be integrated into the program. The example here, word of the day. As the instructor, you choose a word that you are going to say fairly often as part of that lesson. It might be finance. It might be money. It might be health. Something that goes along with the lesson that you're teaching that day. And you just tell the student, every time that I say the word money, jump up and do five jumping jacks or touch your toes five times. Some type of repetitive motion that they can do at their desk, but again, keeps them moving, keeps them involved in, in what we're talking about, keeps them alert. The Building Healthy Wealthy Future program was built upon a logic model. And as we started our logic model on the um, input side, we look at what we have available within Cooperative Extension to invest in the program. We try to make it a very low cost investment. And um, the, the curriculum is based on the materials are things that I think are normally on hand at an Extension office, or at least easy to get and at low cost, as well as the, the people and personnel that we have that could invest in this type of program. We have already discussed the activities. <laughs> Our target audience, again, is that 6th to 8th grade age group, primarily focused on some type of school-based or after-school-based activity. And as we move on into the outcome or the impact uh, section of the logic model, the short-term outcome is that we want to help the students become more aware. We want them to begin to track their eating habits. We want them to begin to track their spending habits, understand their behaviors, that type thing. As we move on into the medium-term impact, we want them to continue those behaviors. So not only do they learn today how to do it, and maybe they do it today, we want them to continue doing it in the future. We also want them to set goals for not only the short term, but also the medium and the long term, and work towards um, achieving those goals. And then finally, the long-term outcomes, which are still obviously yet to be measured, but we want to um, have an impact on the, the reduction of societal problems. So obviously we want to work towards reducing childhood obesity. We want to decrease average debt load. So the more informed that we can make our youth at this age as they're going into high school and they're starting into college and they start to take on student loan debt or they start to take on credit card debt, the more tools that we can put in their box for how to manage those types of situations, then hopefully the better, pre better prepared that they will be going into young adulthood. The um, curriculum does come with an evaluation, which is both for the student and then we also have an instructor evaluation. There's an evaluation for each lesson as well as an overall evaluation for the entire program.
And finally, looking at the publication series, as I mentioned early on, that it complements the Building Healthy, Wealthy Future curriculum. It can be used as standalone if you have, as I said, a parent come into the office or call and ask questions. I think a great way to use it as a take-home piece as you present the lesson in the classroom setting or in the after-school setting is that you send, send the extension publication home with the child as a conversation starter at home. So not only can the parents learn more about what the student learned that day, but then there's also worksheets in there. There are conversation starters, ways for parents to communicate with their children on these topics. Health and finances are both taboo topics. Those are not common conversation topics that families have sitting around the dinner table at night. And so the more conversation that we can encourage our families to have, the better prepared those children will be and the more comfortable that they will feel in communicating with their parents about these topics in the future. And these are two examples of what the extension publications look like. Nicole has done a great job. She has posted the link for the curriculum in the chat box as well as the link to the individual lesson. So if, that, if either of those are something that you would like to access, those links are available in the chat box. And I'm going to pass the baton to Marty, and she is going to address the older adult program. And I think if I'm correct, Katie will take any and all questions at the end. Correct. Questions can be asked in the chat box. still have no control over the slides and can't see them. Oh, that's not good. And I'm not seeing anything in the chat box other than what was there where we were talking earlier. So I don't know, Katie, do you want to? Yeah, Marcia, I'll yeah, just try to go through it the best I can on paper. All righty, we will start you off on um, module 10, Small Steps to Health and Wealth for Older Adults. Thank you. Don't you love technology? And on a Friday, too. Good to be back. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for joining us again. So the um, Small Steps to Health and Wealth for Older Adults, as Jennifer was saying, is a part of the original Small Steps to Health and Wealth program, but in Florida, it's also a part of our Elder Nutrition Food Safety Program as well. So it's Module 10 within that. And I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of the curriculum that's available, tell you how I went about kind of developing it, and then kind of give you just an overview of the lessons, and we'll look at one in just a little more detail. So the overall purpose of Small Steps to Health and Wealth for Older Adults is to provide behavior change strategies to hopefully assist older adults with managing their health and also their finances. So we're providing resources and strategies, so information to help improve both their health and their finances, just in very small steps. So this originated back in 2012 when I conducted focus groups in Florida. I did a total of 15 focus groups across nine different counties about 93 older Floridians, and I specifically asked them about their health and their finance information needs. So basically, you know, what do you have questions about? And then I went on to ask them, you know, if you have questions, where do you seek out information? And it resulted in over 500 pages of transcription. So lots and lots of good information. And then based on that, myself and a graduate student went through and looked at things. So what you'll see from the lessons is the overlying themes that resulted that people specifically wanted information about. So each lesson plan is designed to take about 20 to 30 minutes. And it was designed that way to offer kind of availability in the senior congregate meal sites. And then if you have more time, you can spend more time on activities. You can definitely stretch it out because there's a lot of information that's included in each lesson. And then you can also combine lessons to be able to have a longer one as well. So within the lessons, you have a lesson plan. You've got a class outline. You've got PowerPoints, including speaker notes. 
you've got activities, and then you've got an evaluation for each one of the lessons. So the lessons right now have seven developed. I have about another 13 that are in progress at various stages. And honestly, there could be a lot more developed. That is how much the information need is out there. It's just trying to figure out the connections between the health and the finance to put it together into a lesson plan. So the first one is living well on a shoestring. Then we have understanding labels, your frames of reference, stretching your body and your money, avoiding frauds and scams, taking the driver's seat, and then staying awake, be engaged, be active, and be aware. So we'll take a closer look at the first one, and then I'll just kind of give you an overview of the rest of them. So with lesson one, like I said, living well on a shoestring, you know, when you think, you know, there's lots of health issues that might arise, but there's lots of small steps that we can take to improve our overall health in meaningful ways that won't necessarily hurt our wallet, but can actually help our wallet. So maintaining and promoting positive physical and cognitive health can help prevent further complications and diseases. Living healthier lifestyles can save us money, help us live longer, and help us to be overall happier. Now we do, you know, put a caveat that of course everybody should talk to their doctors about any changes. So each one of the lessons begins with a quote. So for this one you have a quote from Harrison Ford. You know you're getting old and all the names in your black book have an MD after them. So kind of just a way to get people engaged, to kind of get them thinking, and to kind of lighten the mood a little. And then you go into health strategies and wealth strategies or finance strategies for each of the topics. So we have building a frugal, nutritious pantry and freezer. So we give people, you know, just like I said, small steps, small strategies that they can use to not only help them health-wise, but in this case also has implications for their finances. Some of them they may already be doing. Some of them they may not be doing. But again, yeah, just gives them some ideas. You'll see on the next slide, you know, just more ideas for the pantry and the freezer. We talk about cooking in your kitchen, how you could possibly, you know, cook more at home to be able to save. And, you know, a lot of individuals talk about, you know, cooking for one as well. And, you know, we talked about how you can prepare family-sized meals, eat that portion, and then freeze the rest into smaller containers and have those at very end time. And then also thinking about being able to trade that with families and friends to help them out, plus get you some variety going as well within yours. We talk about drinking water. We talk about brain power and how you can try to keep that brain active. And we'll look at the activities in this one, but it actually has some puzzles and games that people can use for free to help keep some of that going active. Then we get into our wealth strategies. So we talk about stepping down your medical expenses. So talking to the pharmacist and your doctor to see if there's maybe a generic drug available if you're using a brand name. And then I'm always amazed at the number of individuals that don't know to check with their local grocery stores to see if they either have a reduced prescription program or a free one. So in Florida, for example, we have Publix that offers quite a few antibiotics totally for free, some of the diabetes medicine for free, and some of the blood pressure medicines for free. My husband, for example, gives his blood pressure medicine free there every month. So it's interesting, you know, some of the resources we might know about that other people don't really know about, so just getting some of that information out to them. Did I hear somebody chiming in? Was that Katie or? No, ma'am. Oh, okay, sorry. We talk about stepping down medical expenses, you know, looking at insurance, looking at Medicare, looking to see, you know, what's covered ahead of time and knowing, you know, expectations. And then if you're uninsured, you know, looking at programs, for example, through the health department that might be able to help with some of that preventive care. And then each one ends with a take-home message. So small steps can make a big impact on the improvement of your health without making a big impact on your wallet. Find creative ways to step down your spending and step up your health. 
And then you'll see the activities on the next one. And I've given you all the link to this. I received permission to be able to use the games for educational purposes with this curriculum. So these are puzzles and games that you can go in and create. And like I said, you can do these in the session if you have time. You can send them home with people to do. You, know, you can go over a few of the answers on some of them and then you know, have people complete the remaining parts at home. But it's definitely an inexpensive way to get people involved and to get them thinking and to use that brain a little more. So then we go into lesson two where we have understanding labels. So lots of times, you know, we know things on an abstract level what seems to be healthy. So for example, fruits and vegetables are good for us. But sometimes it's really hard to distinguish between a lot of the differences that are available and the different choices that we have. You know, lots of food companies use different labels to catch our attention. You know, try to make us believe that their brand is the best or their type of food is better. So when we hear words like no sugar added, organic, all natural, you know, it can really confuse anyone. So we talked to them about looking at some of that and examining what some of that means relative to food products, as well as thinking about it relative to financial products. There's not necessarily a way to certify financial products like food products, but it's still very important for us to understand the labels behind these financial products. So one of the things we use within this is looking at a credit card bill and making sure we understand all of the different aspects of that. So with understanding labels, again, from the health side, we look at the meaning of organic. A lot of people had questions. They hear that term used quite a bit. And they want to make healthy food choices for the most part, but sometimes they think, you know, they only have a certain amount of money, so to get the most bang for their buck, what should they do? So we go through some saving tips for buying organic. Like I said, we talk about the credit card terminology. We talk about minimum payments and not to get caught in that minimum payment trap. You can even you know, bring in, if you've got access to the internet, you can actually do the PowerPoints with this in the um, Senior Congregate Mail site. You, know, you can put up examples and look at paying off one versus adding 10 more dollars to it over the long run with credit cards. So for our activities, we've got Test Your Organic Food Knowledge Quiz. We've got reading your credit card bill, and then thinking about a credit card rule, which is basically, you know, what do we want to do as far as paying off each month, you know, only buying what you can afford to pay off each month, paying on time to avoid additional interest charges, as well as late payment fees. So I'll give you an example, just of a few questions that I pulled from that test your organic food knowledge. So the first one is which of the foods below typically contains the smallest amount of pesticide when grown with traditional methods? And you've got the options of celery, carrots, and onions. And so we let people answer that, and then we talk about the differences. So for example, the correct answer for this one is onions. They're actually on the Environmental Working Group Clean 15 list. As opposed to the celery and the carrots, on the other hand, they contain some of the highest pesticide levels. So if you're really concerned about pesticides, that gives you an idea of where you might actually want to purchase organic. We talk about what does it mean to be labeled organic by the USDA. You know, what percent of the product must be actually listed as organic, and the answer is 95% has to be from organic ingredients. So for example, 5% of a granola bar stamped USDA organic can be from the non-organic ingredients. So that kind of gives people an idea of what they're looking at with that as well. And then let's say you're on a budget and can only afford to pick one produce item to be organic. You know, we talk about the difference between oranges, peaches, and kiwi. And which one might you pick? And the answer would be the peaches. So 97% of the peaches tested were found to have pesticides as opposed to 85% of oranges and 15% of kiwis. So again, you know, it just gives them some information. And you can kind of use the quiz as a way to teach as well. So maybe you haven't covered all of that in the actual lesson, but people are learning from that hands-on 
quiz or that activity, if you want to refer to as that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we get into lesson three, your frames of reference. So lots of times, you know, on that abstract level, we know we want to be healthier, but it can be hard to find a place to start and to really know how to evaluate our priorities as far as being healthier physically as well as financially. So we go through setting activity goals and caloric goals. We talk about food measurement aids. I encourage people to take in actual like tennis balls and mouths and you know, for a computer mouse, you know, a deck of cards, different things like that, so people can actually pass it around and look at it. You can put it up in a picture, but I think having it hands-on can really be helpful as well. You know, we talk about stepping down our spending, so kind of doing our homework, shopping around, using coupons. We talk about ways to increase revenue, so maybe you knit or crochet, and you could look at selling that. Now, you know, we also talk about, you know, if you're going to do that, you want to talk to your tax professional to make sure you're covered that way as well. And we talk about savings and how even at an older age, we could still continue to save because, you know, the risk of outliving our income is great. And, you know, when you think about 60 to 70, well, you might live to 80, 90, 100. So even just those small amounts that we could save, could still add up over a long period of time, which many people definitely still have left. In lesson four, we look at stretching your body and your money. We kind of refer back to lesson three on this about the physical activity. So we talk about setting goals, creating that physical activity plan using the guidelines from lesson three that we talked about. And we talk about creating a spending plan and keeping track of our income and our expenses. Lesson five, to me, is one of the really important ones, avoiding fraud and scams, and how to go about reporting that information. And not only, you know, a lot of the frauds you see out there are the health frauds as well. And we talk about recognizing the red flag for that. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We talk about funeral and cemetery fraud, telemarketing scams, identity theft, charity scams, using ATM machines. We talk about people who call themselves senior specialists and advisors. And we talk about investment fraud. Like I said, they're really packed with lots and lots of information. Lesson six is talking about taking the driver's seat, which basically means being an active participant in your health care and in your finances. So communicating with your health care providers, you know, to ensure that you get the appropriate health care, asking questions. We give them a um, Edith publication that I created that actually walks you through before you go to the doctor's office, writing down all of your questions that you might want to ask and your concerns. Because I don't know, a lot of people, I know this happens to me, I've thought of a lot of stuff, and then by the time I actually get to the doctor's office, and I know their time's valuable, my time's valuable, and I feel hurried sometimes that I actually forget the really important questions that I really wanted to ask. So going in with that plan, you know, going in with all of your list of prescriptions and vitamins and all of that information so your healthcare provider can make an informed decision looking at your overall information. And then we talk about stepping down healthcare costs. And again, you know, thinking about different ways that we can step down some of that and think about, again, you know, asking about generics and different things like that. <coughs> in Florida, one of the things we also talk about is planning in case of hurricanes, for example, and that you might want to have emergency medication on hand in case you can't get that prescription filled for so long. And there's actual laws in these states that allow for your pharmacies to fill that and for the insurance to have to cover it. We give out that type of information as well. And then lesson seven is staying awake, being engaged, being active, and being aware. So really just remaining active in your life, um, active healthy physically, and then also you know within the financial area as well. Anytime we take that back seat, it can just be a cause for problems and issues to creep in that we might not be paying as much attention to. So we talk about preventive health care. 
So health care screenings for various ages. And we talk about financial milestones. So looking at that and see financially when you should be considering different things. As far as where to find the curriculum, it is available at no cost to extension educators on the Rutgers website that you see listed. Um, Jennifer's is also posted there as well. So you can get the whole Small Steps to Health and Wealth program, including the youth and the aging components as well. So it looks like we've got about 15 minutes. Do we want to go ahead and open it up to questions? And just as an FYI, Katie, I can't see questions either. So I will make sure to direct any questions your way, Ms. Marty. Marty, there is a question from you, for you from um, Jane McBurney. She's curious on, is the free prescription at Publix, is it for Medicare or all? It's for everybody. You don't have to show proof of income or anything. Now, like I said, it is a particular list of medicines, but I've went in there with an antibiotic that's on the list myself and gotten it for free. No questions asked. Marty, Jane's real excited because they're coming to North Carolina State, uh, North Carolina State Public. And I know Kroger in Kentucky for sure has a similar program. And Myers has programs like that as well. I mean, just on me personally, just my husband. So. Blood pressure medicine was running at fourteen dollars a month when we had to pay for it through our insurance. So going through public saves that amount, and it may not seem like a lot just in one particular month, but it does add up over the year. And then, like I said, particular antibiotics you can get them there too, and the diabetes medicine for particular ones. Definitely something worth checking into. This is Jennifer and Nicole. You had asked about the success or the evaluations of the Building Healthy, Wealthy Future curriculum. We have had, a, which is a little bit surprising to me, but great success on being able to evaluate the program. We actually did submit the entire evaluation through the University of Kentucky IRB process, which I was a little concerned about since we were dealing with the youth audience, but really had no roadblocks in being able to get that approved and move forward with the evaluation. And our, our feedback has, has been um, really strong. We have about eight different measures that we look at as far as level of understanding and acquired knowledge. And most of the questions that we ask on the evaluation are going to be more towards a COSA type evaluation of um, knowledge, skills, um, awareness, those type things. But as we've done the statistical analysis on it, we've had a statistically significant improvement in all areas on the evaluation. So we were really pleased with the data that we've received back on that. And I see a question from Lee, and I'm not certain if you're asking about the evaluations on the youth curriculum or the aging curriculum. I can comment on the youth that there are evaluations for each learning lesson, as well as an overall evaluation if an instructor is able to deliver all six lessons. And the aging component has an evaluation for each lesson as well. I have, um, I believe it's 34 county faculty in Florida that have been trained to offer this, so we're currently you know, using it and collecting evaluation data. And Nicole asked a question again about the youth curriculum, if there's any difference of evaluation on if we were looking at sixth graders versus 
eighth graders? And the answer to that is no. Now, I will say that we have many more evaluations on sixth graders than we do eighth graders. But um, with, and again, this is a end of session evaluation, and it's designed as a retrospective pre-post. But um, again, we've, we've seen statistically significant mean changes in all areas, regardless of, honestly, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade. I don't think I have any ninth grade evaluations. Nicole asked the question of what advice could you offer to parents of younger children on beginning to help their children make connections between health and financial discipline? I really think, and Nicole and I have actually had this conversation in the past, that communication is key when we're um, talking with younger children, adolescents, teens, that we want to continually keep those lines of communication open. Because, uh, again, our, our children learn from um, us as parents or grandparents or mentors as their example. So the behaviors that we exhibit at home, they are, are picking up and are very likely to model later in life. And, you, you know, I, I'll speak for myself as a parent that I make mistakes just like everyone else. And so if there is a time that we do something that, you know, you think, well, that, that probably was an impulse purchase or that maybe wasn't a real good decision, that you have a conversation with them about it. And I always tell parents that you don't have to, you know, provide all the details to your children. They don't, they don't need to know your income. Um, but they do need maybe some, some gauge of, well, this is why mommy and daddy say no sometimes, that we can't always say yes at Walmart or, um, at the store to the new, new toy and explain why that is and explain to them that yes, mommy and daddy sometimes get things that they need or they want and how that's built into the, the monthly budget. So you want to highlight both the positive behaviors that you're doing at home, but then also talk to them about, I don't necessarily know that failures is the correct word, but just making the conversation comfortable. So that as they do get these messages from school or from television or from their friends, that they're comfortable coming home and saying, hey, mom and dad, what do you think about this? Or my friend today said this. And that you, they're very comfortable of, of bringing that up and that you can just sit down and have a, a conversation with them about it. Ms. Marty, there's a question for you from Nicole Huff. She said, do you have suggestions for adult children on having conversations on health and wealth with their aging parents? Oh, that's a real good question, Nicole. <laughs> it's an excellent question. <laughs> it's not actually addressed within this curriculum, but, you know, my personal thoughts on it is if you've grown up as a child, like Jennifer's indicated, then hopefully you can keep those communications going. It's a grown-up and an adult 
but kind of the opposite that you know there may be a time that you have to step in and help your parents manage their finances for example or to be you know very cognizant of some scams and frauds that could be going on actually have some programming called senior financial safety program that goes into um, caregivers as well and helping manage you know finances for older adults and then also, you know, thinking too about um, estate planning and advanced directives, so financial advanced directives. So if anybody becomes incapacitated, which definitely isn't just applicable to older adults, we need to all be thinking about that. But those are conversations that you possibly want to have with parents as well. Miss Marty, another question from Miss Jane McBurney. She's wanting to know are those documents part of the curriculum that you discussed earlier, advanced directives, etc. And um, I am working on some lessons that do cover advanced directives, including five wishes from aging with dignity. So from a healthcare side, it serves as a healthcare advanced directive in 42 of the states. So those are being developed right now. Actually, the next one I come out with should be communicating your wishes. So. And Marnie, as you develop new lessons, are they automatically uploaded to the Small Steps to Health and Wealth internal site? Yeah, once they go through the peer review process, and then Barb and Karen have reviewed them as well, then they would be added to it. Mari, I know you can't see this, but uh, <laughs> Barb from Rucker says, keep them coming, girlfriend. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Now, like I said, this literally, it could go on so long because there was just so much that I learned from those focus groups and so much information that's needed. And some of it we sit there and think as educators, well, people should know that. But like I said, it's kind of like the grocery store and the prescriptions. Not everybody knows that. And it definitely is a good place to even, like Nicole was asking, starting communications and stuff too to get people thinking. Just putting those little plugs in. Well, it looks like everyone has asked their question. Um, and we want to thank you for attending today's webinar. And thank you for putting up with all our wonderful technology joys on this Friday morning. So if you haven't already, please enter in your email address. Um, and I will send you an evaluation later today. We thank you for joining us today. And we also thank Dr. Jennifer Hunter from the University of Kentucky and Dr. Marta Gillen from the University of Florida for their time and their expertise today. And on behalf of Jennifer, Marty, and myself, we thank you for joining us. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.